Welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast with Scott McKenzie. Scott is a passionate industry professional dedicated to transferring cutting-edge, industry-focused innovations and trends while highlighting the men and women who keep the world moving. So put on your hard hat, grab your work boots, and let's go. All right, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast, the number one industrial and manufacturing podcast that is dedicated 100% to you, the industrial and manufacturing professionals, the companies that get it done, you are bold, you are brave, you dare greatly. Man, do you innovate. And that's why we celebrate you each and every day on this particular podcast because you're changing my lives and you're changing the lives around the world and we celebrate you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Now, we're going to be talking to a geez, a great guy, knowledgeable, and uh, a friend. His name is Dave Ryber. Riber Reliability is his company, and we're going to be talking a lot about leadership, but boy, do we need leadership now in this next normal. So let's get cracking. Yeah, leadership is a big deal. If you don't think it's a big deal, well, you know, you don't want to listen to Dave. But Dave, I'm, I'm telling you, man, Dave has been around the block a couple of times. He has a tremendous amount of experience when it comes to leadership. He has wonderful insights. He is an amazing, amazing Professional and gentleman, all packaged up into a good guy. I don't know if that's a possibility, but that's who he is. All right, before we get into that interview, because I know you want to listen to it, uh, we've got an exciting, uh, I, I guess, a project that has been going on, and, and uh, it's evolving. I think I'm getting feeling more comfortable with being able to share it with you, and it's a model. And if, if, if I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm preaching about the necessity to collaborate, innovate, and uh, educate with a sense of speed and purpose so that you can survive, rebuild, and prosper in this whatever next normal, we call it, then I've got to put my money where my mouth is. And I'm working with a couple of companies right now to come up with this unique model because it's innovative. And it's innovative because it uh, addresses a lot of things that I think are very uh, important going forward. Got a meeting today. I'm going to probably do a couple more tweaks, but you know, be on the lookout for this. But this is this is going to be something that that I'm going to share and and hopefully uh, ask for your participation in some way, shape, or form. But I think it's a it's an important uh, support of the collaboration, innovation, and, and education you know direction that I think we have to really begin to embrace in this next normal. And and hopefully it you know put some money in your pocket. That's a big deal. I, I want you to prosper. Definitely. All right. Let's get going with the interview. Now, Dave, Dave, I've, I've, I've known for a number of years. And uh, every time, and I mean 100% of the time, when he is, uh, when we talk, when he's been on other podcasts, he just brings just such tremendous sage advice. And I think right now, in this next normal, his advice is absolutely more important than ever before. Bar none. And, uh, you, you can rest assured that he's coming from a perspective of experience, of leadership. So we're going to be talking a couple of things. One, you got to develop your leadership skill. He'll talk about that. And, and, and develop the people. Leadership skill, develop the people. And that's real important. And then um, feed the brain. And we talk about education. It's all in line with what we were talking about. Feed that brain. You, you should be educating each and every day. It's out there. Make it a minute. Make it two minutes. Take it, make it ten minutes. It doesn't really matter. It's all over the place. It doesn't matter. Feed the brain. And then uh, one of the interesting recommendations is, of course, uh, get a mentor. And I, I couldn't think of a better mentor than uh, Dave Ryber. No way. He's an amazing man. So those are the three components that we're going to be talking about as we uh, expand into this uh, interview with Dave Ryber. So let's get going. Dave Ryber. Riber Reliability is his company. Talk and leadership. Enjoy. Wow. Dave, welcome to the Industrial Talk Podcast. You are an absolute joy to have you on this particular podcast because you, you mean a lot to me. You do. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you. you're a hero of mine. I can't believe you said yes because you've had a great journey. And um, I am just so honored that you said yes to getting on the uh, the old Industrial Talk Podcast. So, listeners, he's got a, um, I don't know, it's a, I don't know, trainload of uh, experience, 
spanning decades, and uh, you're in for a treat. Dave, for the listeners out there, give us a little 411 on uh, who you are. Okay, well, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate you having me on, by the way. You're, you're uh, doing wonderful things with what yeah. you do, and we appreciate you for what you do. Thank you. Um, so a little of uh, me. Uh, I started out, you know, a long time ago, obviously, as an electrician in the Saginaw Electricians Local of Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, as construction kind of dried up, I ended up at General Motors as an electrician. And, um, and then the boss said, gosh, we need somebody to run crews here. Are you interested? And I said, man, I don't know. You don't treat your salary guys as good as I'd like, but I guess I'll give it a try. And the, so I, I, I've, I've got this thing about me. And so I just get a little um, tidbit about that. I always aspire to greater things. I've never been able to not aspire to greater things. So I went from being a foreman to a general foreman, to being a manager, to being a North American manager, to being a global manager. And so in my span of 30 years, I uh, got to see and do a lot of things. I'm thankful to General Motors for that. Even though we went through some tough times and a bankruptcy, um, I got to see the world. I got to do things that most people only dream of. And so um, it was very fun for me. And then we retired from GM. I went to work for Reliability Web uh, and Uptime Magazine and that whole thing, if you know those guys, and got to teach certified reliability leadership. And I just loved it. This was my dream job, to be able to tell people some of the things that I stubbed my toe on the way up the ladder and maybe help them not make some of those mistakes. The leadership piece, in my opinion, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on today, is the one thing that I think is probably missing uh, more than ever. And in fact, since this pandemic issue has come about, I think it's even subdued more. And so uh, leadership in its purest forms, uh, and, they're, and it's definitely personal, and it's personal for all of us, where you fit uh, into your organization. And if you can define your um, quality and your uh, value stream for how to make reliability and leadership happen in your organization, now you got a chance, but it is personal. I've heard people say, well, it's not personal. Yes, it is. It's personal to every one of us. I don't care if you're yeah. the speaker of the floor or the CEO, you have a personal journey and you should be able to define what that looks like in relationship to this leadership piece that you do and, and, what it, and how it impacts your organization. So I think that's most important and probably the most important thing I learned. And I, again, it was a, a, a great uh, path for me to run down. Now, since we have no workshops and conferences, I find myself having uh, retirement time, and <laughs> I, yeah, I've loved it. Absolutely loved it. I got my man cave in order. I got my Corvette shined up. I bought myself a, a Cadillac for a retirement present that I really like, and so, um, yeah, I still want to have my hands in the business some, but I do truly enjoy my time. Yeah, but Dave, you're you're still young. You're still you're still passionate. Uh, we can have this probably this conversation in a year, and I bet you're you're. <laughs> view of retirement might be a little bit different because you're you you're you've got a lot of energy you got a lot of passion you got a lot of desire to help people succeed and and that's not going to go away with retirement it's not going to go away with rounds of golf you're going to always have that that's my story talk to me in six months we'll have a different conversation trust me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not the first person who's told me that. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you, it's fine. Yeah, you can you can live in that dream world, but it's going to change. Now, one of the things that uh, I've been very fortunate after seven, eight hundred podcasts that I've done, uh, there's there are themes that have evolved and sort of sprung forward, and especially today in COVID or next normal or whatever we call this world that we're living in. Some of the things from a business manufacturing industry perspective, uh, I've been preaching on the necessity to collaborate, right? You, yeah. you don't have all the answers. Uh, you might have a little snippet of the answer, but Dave might have another piece of that puzzle and, and so on and so forth and be able to come up with a clear picture on how to proceed forward in this next normal. That's one thing. Two, to innovate, right? not just from a, uh, a technology perspective, which is important, which is on everybody's uh, you know, bucket list to innovate technology-wise, but also innovate from a, from a human perspective. Uh, your organization is gonna change. Uh, business is changing. Doing business as usual is not gonna be the case. The right. next one is educate, right? 
you're going to have to educate. Things are happening fast. And uh, unless you are committed to really learning with your collaborative team, not just internal, external, from an innovation perspective, and, and you got to do it with a sense of speed. One of the real, bink, you know, red flags that have popped up is leadership. And the reason for that is I think pre-virus, pre-COVID, whatever you want to call that, uh, you could get away with sort of questionable leadership. Mm-hmm. Now we're in the, the, the pandemic. Uh, we, we, need, we need a level leaderships to get us and get your company, get people moving forward. And it's always a people issue. What's your thinking on that, my friend? Well, boy, I'm so glad you asked that question because as I said, as I've been able to go out and teach the leadership skills and actually talk about it, there's two things that come to mind immediately. And the first one is, I've heard people say, well, you know, leaders are born leaders. If you're not a born leader, you can't be a, you know, just can't be a leader. And I uh, just adamantly, uh, adamantly say no to that. You can develop leadership skills. And in fact, my personal opinion of that is, is that if you're not developing all the time and growing at all the time, you'll become stagnant, even in your own leadership skills. And so I believe you develop people and you develop people uh, and uh, you and I were having a conversation, you know, before, and one of the best keynotes I ever heard was Tom Peters talking about people skills and developing people and giving case studies of why it works. Well, here's a guy with a pedigree who can talk the talk, walk the walk of really making it happen with development of people. And I was completely um, enamored with it. Even though I was already teaching leadership, I was really excited to hear what he had to say about it based on case studies because the truth of the matter was every single success story that he could go to and talk to at least in the manufacturing world was all wrapped around developing people and he said once that that blossom started blossoming it was sometimes just an effort to get out of the way of it and let it grow because the development of the right people let me say it that way. The development of the right people with the right skill sets just made everything fly. If we think for one moment that a one person is a trade-off for another person, in other words, well, I'm having a layoff today. I'm going to lay off Scott and I'm going to bring in Dave. Do you really think that Dave has the same skills, the same personality, the same delivery that Scott no. does? Absolutely no. not. No. I love what Scott does, but I respect it enough to say that that's not probably my, my best fit. And if we think that we can just make this happen, a person is a person is a person, it's not. And so that's, that's the number one thing with it. And the other piece of this around it is feeding your brain. Um, uh, you mentioned the, the pandemic and how this has been an issue with us. When people get subdued and depressed and, they, and it happens, and you see it happening right now more than wow. ever, it really scares me because I know that when people are in that particularly mode, they're not going to be innovative. They're not going to take steps that others won't. They're not going to step outside the lines. And so from my perspective, it squashes innovation and it squashes your growth. And so how do we change that? How do we, like you said, it's going to be some, uh, well, to start with, and at least from a big company like me, it's policies, it's procedures, it's education, it's talking to your supply chain. Because guess what? Even if you come back up to speed in your manufacturing organization, what makes you think your suppliers are on the same path? Right? Could be a major issue, couldn't it? So we're talking about we need to really branch out. And this is where leadership is key. Because if you can't communicate with with your suppliers and with your customers at that level, but this new level of leadership, this in depth level, you're going to have a problem. And if you can't feed your people what they need, I know you and I were talking before yeah. and, and I like to, and I like to feed myself with things. So one of the quotes I had behind my desk at General Motors for all these years, and I had one guy come my house one time, by the way, and he said, I don't know if that should be there. And I told him it's going to be there as long as I am. And so I'll start out. I didn't give you the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to give, read the whole thing because I want you to know what it says. I want to hear it. It says, always be kinder than necessary. Always aspire to greater things. Be the example for your team. Very, very few of us will work long enough, be persistent enough, we will be consistent enough, and relentless enough to succeed. 
And success is not luck. It is a choice, a mission, and a quest. And that is why I believe you have to work your tail off day in and day out to stay on top. And you have to feed your brain this type of thing. If you're not feeding your brain that, you know, uh, you mentioned Think of a Rich by Napoleon Hill, one of my favorite yeah. books of all time. It probably is my favorite book of all time. His, if you hit all the one-liners in that book, it's, it's, he's got one It's, it's like a book. meme okay. book. It's like yeah. a business yeah. meme book. It just keeps on hammering. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's full <laughs> of them. And yeah, anything you can conceive and believe you can achieve, those types of things. If you keep feeding yourself that kind of stuff, I think your outcomes have a lot better chance of happening. If you keep feeding yourself fear, anger, subdue, hiding, you know, this doesn't work for us humans. It really doesn't. And, and I'm sorry about that, you know, for those of you who are very fearful, but at the same time, try to feed yourself positive stuff. There's a lot of positive stuff. Another one of my favorite things is, is Vince Lombardi. I'm a huge fan of Vince Lombardi. Right, right. And I love Vince Lombardi quotes. And I actually have some Vince Lombardi quotes. And I love Vince Lombardi because He's not, he was never afraid to tell people how he really, how he really feels about things. You know, I like this one. If it doesn't, if score doesn't matter, why do we keep score? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, right. we got a participation trophy. Does it matter who won? Yeah. I guarantee yeah. it matters. It, folks. It, everybody right. knows what the score is. They might not want it to. Yeah. They know. They know. Yeah. Some want to talk about it. Some don't. Right. Yeah. I like this one. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. We talked about that before. Hey, you know what? I want to be a basketball player, but I'm 5'11". I say I'm six feet, but I'm actually five eleven. Right. If I had a six six, maybe I had a better chance. I don't know. Maybe if I could run faster and jump higher. I don't know. But it never worked out for me. I had to find a field that I could excel in. And I think that's what you do. You don't give up. You find the field you can excel in. And I think we all have these gifts. Uh, my okay. principal in my Catholic school that I went to put me aside one day and said, meet me in the library. And I'm going, oh, no. What I do? I'm in trouble. Yeah. So I go to the library. Because you didn't go to the library back in those days, you could get hit, you know. It was okay for them to hit you. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but I'm in trouble, right? Yeah. Well, I get to the library, and she points her finger in my face, and she says, you have gifts. Okay. You're not using them. You're sitting in the back of the room. You don't answer any questions. You don't raise your hand. You don't participate. When they ask for a team captain, you don't, you know, volunteer. But you know things because I used to read voraciously. Remember, I, I, I was a very sickly child. I had lots of issues with, I had chronic pneumonia and I had rheumatic fever and I was in hospitals a lot. So I read, just read all the time. We didn't have Google. I'd have been Googling everything. But, oh, yeah. But, but I read. And so anyway, uh, she said, you should be ashamed of yourself. We don't all get the same gifts. Some people run higher, run faster, jump higher and do things that you don't. You have other gifts and you need to use them. And you know what? And then she turned around and walked out of the room. I thought, well, I didn't get hit. That's all good. But I feel like I got hit. <laughs> yeah, you, you got hit in the heart. <laughs> but here's the moral of that story. Um, I changed that day, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I became a leader. I made a choice. I started sitting in the front of the classroom. I started raising my hand. I started volunteering to be captain. And you know what? My life changed. And I loved it. And I wasn't never turning back and I never have. And so I tell that story to people, not for them to see that, oh, well, Dave's special. No, I want you to know that you can do this. It's a choice. Just yeah. go do it. I, I, I love it. I love the fact. And, and, and the fact that you're, you're, what, 45 now and you still remember <laughs> that story. 65? No, I didn't, I didn't okay. say it. You did, not me. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're absolutely right. I, I think we place limits on ourselves and I don't think we have to. Mm -hmm. I think the limits are placed there because we don't like the feel of uh, or the, the sting of failure or embarrassment or, but that's, that's life. The, the people that truly excel that from a, from a human perspective, uh, look at mother Teresa, same mother Teresa goes out there, pulls people dying in the gutter and brings them in and gives them love. Mm -hmm. she changed the world yes and and so you see stories like that we have we have that in us 
Yes. We just have to say yes and do it and, and get knocked down. I mean, we, we, that's all it is, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just – so don't be frightened of it. Right. Especially I was reading about that, by the way, your business beatitudes there, the saint, yeah. of, gener the saint of generosity. I love that quote. And that, that goes along with my be kinder than necessary. I, yes. I just think that's – and, you know, and, and I probably learned that the hard way. You know, but it's still, in my opinion, servant leadership works. It does. It just works. If you're you sitting there having a pity party, if you're sitting there, and it's tough. Don't get me wrong. This two-figure death punch we call COVID, it's, it's impacted families. It's impacted businesses. It's impacted the whole world, right? We got it. We understand it. I challenge, if, you, if you're, woe is myself, woe is me, oh, gosh, nobody's worse than me. No, you're in a big pool of people that are struggling reach yeah. out help them yeah Think anxiety has never been in a higher level i i totally agree with that it's and this anxiety that we're all feeling it's real you know and i and i i do i absolutely understand that i had some of that anxiety i had anaphylactic shock twice in a week from a medicine i was taking and i thought i was going to die and i found out that i had anxiety and I could experience panic attacks and I didn't even know what they were. Wow. But now that I know what they are and I understand what they are, I definitely feel for people who have this high anxiety. It's awful. It's just absolutely stunning what it can do to you. Your subconscious brain is the most powerful, powerful thing. So like I said, getting back to feeding yourself the good stuff. Feed and, and, and that's, ex that's exactly spot on. Force yourself incremental it just read one great quote whatever that might be um if you're a leader help communicate reach yeah. out that impacts people do it think of the other help the other especially now i mean businesses are are i mean it's it's now people i mean you can oh, change agree. lives yeah my my strongest uh inclination these days is when it goes that when it, to go along with what you're saying is to always be that person who's there to help and support there's no reason in fact I, I think probably the most the best leaders that i can think of my best mentors that i can think of were always the people who went out of their way to help me even though they didn't have to you know i remember getting on an elevator with ron moore and then you know who ron moore is and many oh, of heck yeah as well ron, <laughs> ron moore is an icon in the business of maintenance and reliability and and i met ron moore first time on an elevator and ron moore looked at me and he goes oh you're dave riper and i looked at him and i thought how in the world does he know me right because he's like an icon yeah. And I got chatting with him just briefly in the elevator and he invited me to dinner with him and his wife later on. And I was so excited. And I found that when you approach guys like him and guys like Jack Nicholas and other great leaders in the, in the business that I was in, if with a humble attitude and I just want to learn from you attitude, they just poured it into my brain. Like it was the greatest and it's a gift, right? Now, the other side of that coin is, and I, this is the, the caution I like to give people is, if you approach guys like him the wrong way, like you're real arrogant and you know it all already, he's going to call you on it and he's going to know, he's going to know, right? You can't fake this dude out. So no. don't ever do that. So here's my, here's my Ron Moore story. Okay. So, so this guy's got mad street cred out there. He's, he's really a no BS guy. Yep. And uh, he knows his stuff. And everybody knows he knows his stuff. So once again, to your point, don't, don't try to pull one over on him. So I always approached him from a sort of a jokey part of – so <laughs> I'm sitting down there. It was at a conference. I'm interviewing him. We're chit-chatting. The, the fire alarm goes off in this conference. And people are running out. Mm -hmm. He's sitting there. And he looks at like he said, eh, fire alarms. He goes, I got to go to the bathroom. And he goes the other way. He just gets up and leaves and goes the other way. And it's like, all right, eh, we'll take a break. Uh -huh. <laughs> and yep. that was wrong. He's like, eh, I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, okay. it's time. Yeah. And so, but that there, are, there are people like that. And, and one of the best things about not just you, but, but Ron, he really – instilled in me the, the power of that, that sort of incremental approach. You don't have to look at that elephant like a 
big ass elephant. You right. can you can take a bite out of, at a time. And he was very big into that incremental approach to your business, to your assets, to your organization, and and achieving victories. And you just can't imagine the the feeling of being able to achieve those victories, positive, because it's all human. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's and it, and it was simple. Uh, which tool to use when? You know. Yep. His common sense approach is just amazing. Which software to use when? Which tool to use when? You know, and then when you go to the well, when do you ask for help? You know, I, I always think of, in my brain, I use the, what they call the RASIC approach to life, you know? So, you know, who's responsible? Who's accountable? Who's supporting? Who, who do I include? And then who am I consulting with when I'm lost? Because I get lost too. We all get lost. You oh. don't know everything. Gosh, the first thing you want to admit to yourself, you don't know everything. So who do I call? Who do I get on my team? I want a Scott on my team. You know, I want a Ron on my team. I want Jack on my team. And the guys like that who are going to be very knowledgeable, who know, like you said, no BS guys are just going to flat tell you, hey, that's not going to work. And guess why? We tried it. And here's what happened. And uh, gosh, some of the best guys you can talk to. Because oh, we can trial error everything to death, but you know what? Like you, the other part piece you made was in this day and age, in this information age, you ain't got time for that. Yeah, I've got time. Yeah, your competitors are going to eat your lunch. That's you better learn time. as fast as you can from the best people you can as fast as you can. Which does bring me around to that mentorship piece. Yeah. Please, younger folks, get a mentor. And if yeah. and if this person is a hard nut to crack. Be persistent in trying to get them to help you. And if you can't, move on to another one. And you mentors, you folks with enough years under your belt, mentor some people. I for gosh it. sakes, we downsized and right sized for 20 years in manufacturing, and we don't have enough apprenticeships and interns to help now. And so us guys that are getting up there in years, we got to help people. And, and I just feel so obligated to that. I remember I heard one guy say one time, well, I learned it the hard way they can too. And I'm like, please don't do that to people. No. <laughs> I mean, that's awful. Um, if you know it was hard to learn the hard way and it was painful, why would that be okay? I don't know. I'm not sure. But, and, and, I'll, and, and I won't say that some of those hard knocks aren't got, don't have some value because they do. The hard knocks, a lot of them have value. But when we can circumvent some of that and really help people, to me, that's the gift that you can give today. And that's the gift that I hope I can help people with. And that is, you know, what, guess what? I tried that one and boy, did I screw up. <laughs> See, but again, there's a, there's a mental component to that, Dave. And that's people don't like to fail, but I, I'm sort of of the, the, the opinion that if I can, I can fail fast, learn fast, and, and I can keep on going. So do it. And it's, it's not that, either you win or lose. It's, it's either you win or you learn and you just keep on going. You never lose. You just, and in your mentor uh, approach, absolutely agree. 100% listeners find a mentor, be a mentor, either, or it doesn't, I mean, mm -hmm. that is that other focus that you need to do, especially now, especially now just find and, and help people succeed with their career, with their life, with their, yep. Do it. I, I, I just absolutely, there's a, there's a term that I've been bantering back and forth or thinking about, Dave, and I want to throw it out to you. It's, uh, I had a conversation with somebody, and we talk about a couple of things. Authenticity, authenticity, transparency, and the big one is vulnerability. And I think today, as opposed to pre- I think those qualities are needed in a leader. What do you think? <laughs> Give me the first two words again. Authenticity and transparency. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Because I could go on with this for an hour, as you know that. Yeah. Um, so here, transparency, baby. let's start with that first. I think a lot of people miss the boat on transparency um, in two ways, you know. Because uh, the transparency piece is probably the easiest to fix. Um, and that is this. I like, when I talk from a transparency perspective, I like to have things written down. But what, when people say, well, why? Why does that work for you? Well, it's like this. 
If I tell you that, well, I did it this way, this way, and this way, and they go, why? Well, it's our policy here. It's part of a procedure or a policy that we've written. It's part of a mission statement. It's part of a value statement. It's part of the way we do business at whatever, you know, at uh, rival reliability, I'll say at this point. Uh -huh. if, if we say that we have often, well, excuse me, let's stay with transparency. If we say we have transparency, we should try to back up as much of it as you can with a document. I'm going to start with that. The other side of transparency links directly to the authenticity piece, all right? I once interviewed for a job, and it was uh, around Maximo, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, Maximo is a software, if those of you who want to know that, for work orders, and it's gigantic. It's, it, I, to give you an idea, it's like 56 um, applications and 134, or excuse me, modules, 34 modules and like 56 modules and 118 applications. That's what it is. So it's like 56 gig if I put it on your computer. And, and we were doing this interview and, and the one guy said something to me about, well, if this, then that. And I said, hey, we, we can't do it that way because, be, because we don't know how to do that. Oh, never tell a customer you don't know how to do something. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, guy. We sometimes have to tell a customer we don't know how to do something. I've got to move quick, but I'm okay. Uh, anyway, um, so that transparency piece is you sometimes have to say, I don't know how to do that. Remember I said, look at things with a brassic approach. When yeah. do I consult? Who do I talk to? When do I talk to them? What do I say? You know, that's being transparent. If I would lie to people and say, well, I know how to do that. I better pull something out of my hat real quick, huh? That doesn't work. It doesn't. And it, you know, so yeah. being transparent to me is it's like the most important thing I can do as a leader is tell people, I don't know how to do that, but I know somebody who does, or I know who to call, and I know where to go. Oh, and I'll give you a time and a date. Nothing irritates me more than somebody who does it, well, we don't know how to do that, and they drop it. Like, no, can't be dropped. Go find out, right? Go find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do move. So yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna dovetail with that, but I'm gonna digress a little bit. So we okay. uh, we painted our house inside, <laughs> right? Okay. We're trying to match the paint. So we go to a hardware store, and it's an old can of paint. It's rusty. It's all messed up. We're trying to match that paint just because that was the paint, right? So we're sitting there, and and to your point, so I get there, standing at the front of the 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 paint whatever workshop area said, I want that paint. Can you match it? So he has to try to pry it open, right? So he's prying uh -huh. it open. He's prying open this can. It's rusty. It's a, it's a pain, right? And uh, he comes back and I'm watching him do this. And you can only imagine my, what's going through my head. So I'm watching him do this. And he just says, I can't get it open. <laughs> he just gave up right then and there. And I said, really? It's <laughs> Give it to me. Give it to me. I took the <laughs> hammer and I'm just beating it right in front of them, ripping the can open. I said, there you go. Don't, don't come to me and just shrug your shoulders and say, ah, I can't do it. So, so to your point, it's like, do it. You can do it. Make a mistake. Let yeah. people. And that is a good point, though. I, and it gets back to what I started with when I was talking about this consistent, persistent, long enough. Yeah. It's that people... And I, don't, and I hate to say this because they don't like to stereotype anybody, but some people think it's okay now to say, I can't. Ah. I grew up in a world where my dad used to tell, tell me there's no such word as can't. Yeah. And, and I told you that in manufacturing, there's no excuses in manufacturing. You tell the boss uh, on the final line at a car or truck plant where they make a car every one minute and the profit line on that is considerable. And you can talk about anywhere from five to $600,000 an hour loss if you're not running. And uh, you try and give them the same excuse about why you can't do something. And they're gonna say something to you like, how come you don't like working here? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, and, and, the, and the old adage was, there's no excuses in manufacturing. And so I guess that's the world I came from. And so when people say, well, I, it's okay to just give up here. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. Call. But don't you think, help. Dave, that there's a, there's a fear of failure? 
and and we I'm telling you right now there's there in in corporate culture there has been the the the, the sledgehammer of fear of failing yeah and I and I Yes. And for me, it's like, hey, I'm just glad you moved forward. You've just learned how not to do one way. Go forward and try it again. Here's a suggestion. Do it that way. You've got to get people through that. You've got to help mentor them through those challenging times. Mm-hmm. Oh, the fear of failure is real. It's been going on our whole life, our whole career. And that fear of failure, at least from our perspective, at least from my perspective, is pretty simple. It's like, um, and we worked under some terrible regimes. I'll tell you right now, uh, this was prior to GM's bankruptcy, and there were some, some regimes that were so difficult to work for. Uh, they had fear was part of my life. And, and uh, I'm not good at fear, by the way. I'm not really good at that. I'm like, okay, um, if this, then that, so what, you know, I'm going to move on anyway. Yeah, right. But, but some people were so afraid. Now, when we talk about this fear thing, it squashes innovation. No one who is in a fearful position is going to take steps that others won't. And to me, this is the biggest difference between great leaders and so-so leaders. Great leaders are always innovative and they're always willing to take steps that others won't. And they're always out on the outside of you know, of, I want to say outside of the fear factor to the point where they're like, hey, I can't sit here on my hands any longer with this happening, right? You and I were just talking about it before, your brain will not shut off. Mine no one either. And if something's just not right, you know, I got to work on it. I can't sit there and like, well, it's okay. I'm just going to let it go. Um, it doesn't work for me. And I hope it doesn't work for a lot of people. Yeah. So persistent, yeah. get over the fear work through it, whatever you got to do. But I do agree with you. This fear of failure is real. Yeah, it is. Now, one last point, vulnerability. One of the things that uh, has been taught with leaders is that you're not vulnerable. You have the answers. You're it. You're the last deciding factor in whatever decision tree you're going down. You're it. But then there's this push about vulnerability. and, And it's like, especially today, I'm finding I don't have the answers. I need answers. I need people to help me. To your point, Jack and Ron and, and others, you need, you need to be able to, you need to just squash that and, and, and find answers by people who might have it. Right. You need to be vulnerable. No, I totally agree. It says sometimes you have to be the guy who stands up and says, gosh, I don't need that. And gosh, I need some help. Yeah. And I'm going to go get it. And uh, we're going to be successful in spite of it. I love it. Quick second. You got it. All right, listeners, he's, uh, that's Dave Reiber. He's uh, dropping some leadership value bombs as he goes out of his house just because that's what COVID's all about. We are real on this particular podcast. There he is. He's back. Sorry about that. <laughs> my computer's going dead, and I asked my wife to grab my cord. <laughs> uh, that's all fine and dandy. It's all good. We're going to have to wrap it up anyway. We're, okay. we're at that point. We've been, uh, we've been chatting for a good half hour, a good solid half hour on leadership. Say hello to your lovely wife for me. I know that you I will do that, Scott. I always appreciate talking with you, and I, I think what you do is outstanding in this business, and uh, thank you for doing it. Nah, there, there's just some great people that we just need to celebrate, you being one of them. And uh, that is a fact, Jack, and there's a lot of people like you and others that, that have a passion to help people, have mm-hmm. a passion to just help companies succeed, and especially now. That's why you can't retire. You might want to play golf. You might want to just sit there and polish your Corvette here. But the reality is, is that you have something to give. You have some insights that companies need to succeed because we depend on them to succeed. Then you can retire. But right now, we need people like you. How about that? Thank you so much. Put that in the pipe and smoke it. <laughs> well, I do want to. I do want to thank you know. I didn't mention uh, uh, Terry O'Hanlon and Reliability Web, but I will mention Terry also. I mean, I worked for Terry for all, about four years, and I really, like I said, it was a dream job at Reliability Web, and and so Terry's another one of those uh, thought leaders that uh, yep. that I would love to thank, and uh, and then so guys like Jack Nicholas and Ron Moore. And like yourself, Scott, it doesn't matter what field of work you're in as much as can you affect people. One of my favorite people of all time is Zig Ziglar. 
And no. Zig Ziglar used to make a quote, or used to say, and I won't say it exactly like he does, I'm sure, but he said that your rewards in life and in your afterlife are directly related to how many people you help in this life. And so my feeling about that is uh, spot on with what you were just talking about. If yeah. I can help you, if I can help take some of the bumps out of your road, if I can make you feel better about yourself and where you're headed, on your next uh, piece of this journey, I will feel great about it. Uh, and uh, and Vince Lombardi said there, there's something in good people that wants and needs discipline. And that discipline is the stuff we've been talking about, about the leadership, about what to feed your brain with, yeah. where to go next, who to consult with, yeah. those things. So um, good for me. It's good for, for the whole group. Uh, of, of those leaders when we go out and do those types of things. And, and let's, Frank, let's face it, I think it's our responsibility. I don't think it's something that you should just think about doing. It's our responsibility. Uh, it is, and I absolutely. So if you're feeling down on yourself and you're, getting, you're consuming, help somebody. Think of another person that you can help, and I'll tell you right, right now, your attitude will definitely change. All right, Dave, thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. Absolute All right. joy and honor. Listeners, do not go away. We're going to wrap it up. Hey, by the way, Dave, are you, you active out on LinkedIn right now? I am. All right. Yep. Dave Ryber, we're going to have all the links of being able to get a hold of Dave because uh, I'm telling you right now, he can help you in a big way. So stay tuned. We will wrap it up on the other side. You're listening to the Industrial Talk Podcast Network. Thank you very much again for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. Dave Ryber is his name. The company is Ryber Reliability. He is dropping leadership truth bombs on this particular podcast. I knew you wouldn't be disappointed. That's Dave Ryber. You can find all the information you want about Dave Ryber. Reach out and, and go to the industrialtalk.com for all of the information. Now, again, we're going to be rolling out a new program. So keep, keep your eye on it. And it's going to all be about collaboration, innovation, as well as education, supporting how you can, once again, survive, rebuild, and prosper in this particular next storm. Because, doggone it, you're going to have to. All right. I challenge you, bold, be bold, be brave, dare greatly. But I challenge you to find individuals to hang out that are bold, that are brave, that dare greatly. And I guarantee you, it's going to change the way you look at life. Thank you very much for joining the Industrial Talk Podcast. We're going to be back with another great interview shortly.